Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so excited to be here with Dervla. Um, she is the author of three books, uh, The Ruin, which is the first of the series, The Scholar, which we have just all completed reading in our book clubs, um, which we all, we all loved. And I can feel very confident in saying that because there was a lot of a really amazing feedback. I actually got one of my hosts saying, this is the only book that everybody has agreed on. <laughs> no way. Oh my God. I could die happy now. Thank you, everybody. That's brilliant. Uh, and she's actually got the third one coming out called The Good Turn, and that will complete the three book series. Um, but she's working on another one, and we hope to hear a little bit about that tonight as well. So, Dervla, can you please just introduce us to how you got into writing, what kind of it looked like, the background, the history of you becoming such a, a wonderful author? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's kind of a, well, I kind of came to it in a funny sort of way because, look, I've always been a reader, probably like all of us. I've been a reader since I was very small. And I've always been passionate about books. And if I, you know, writing was my daydream, but not my dream, because for me, I just felt it was completely unrealistic, not something I, anybody could ever do to support themselves. And I never took it seriously. And I became a lawyer, which I didn't particularly enjoy, but felt like the responsible choice. Um, and when I was about 26, I set up my own small legal practice in the west of Ireland. Um, and it was very successful until it wasn't. When the GFC hit Ireland, it impacted my family really badly. And it hit, impacted everybody in Ireland, but we were hit particularly badly. And, you know, our house was worth less than half of what we had paid for it. All We lost all our savings. The practice kind of fell apart and, and I was had a new baby on the way and I just said to my husband I just don't want to do it all over again I, I just worked 60 hour weeks for the last four years building the practice I couldn't face it a second time and he was a civil engineer and we just said you know what let's go for a fresh start and I'm very conscious of our friend from Toronto because our choice at that point there was just no work happening in Ireland and in order to work we would have had to leave so our choices were Canada or Australia and because for a lot of very boring reasons I won't go into, we chose Australia, we moved to Perth and, you know, we were really starting again with nothing. Um, this was about eight years ago. And I remember at the time I called the Law Society to see, could I be readmitted as a lawyer, you know, and practice over here. And I remember going to my husband and saying, great news, they're going to admit me straight away and I can practice immediately. <laughs> and he took one look at my face and he was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? The whole point of this big change was that we start all over again and we, we do it our way this time and we pursue the things we love because we did everything so responsibly the first time and it didn't work out. This time we get to do it our way. So to make a long story short, when I did go back to work after my little boy was born, I went back to work part time and I started writing at night. Um, so it was 2014 I started writing seriously and I just, every single night I wrote for two hours after work and after the kids were in bed. Um, except Thursday, which was wine night, very important, key. And then I just kind of, you know, I wrote about 20, 30,000 words of the ruin, what became the ruin, and it was terrible. You know, it's terrible when you're starting. You don't know what you're doing, and you've been reading for years, so you know what's good, and you're reading what you've written, and it's terrible. So, you know, you scrap it, and I stopped writing for a while, but I just, I could never leave it alone. I always had to come back to it. I then I got shortlisted in a, little, in a little short story competition, which gave me a bit more confidence. And I just went back and kept writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting. And then I don't, are any of you guys writers? If, you, if anybody's a writer, maybe they could say it in the chat and then I'll know. But um, if you are, you know that there are Twitter pitch competitions when you're trying to get an agent. So one night as a procrastination exercise, I entered a Twitter pitch competition, even though the book wasn't ready. And I kind of immediately forgot about it. And, but the, the, the agent actually liked my tweet so I had to send in my first 50 pages. I did that and then I forgot about it. And then fast forward to July 2016, and this is a bit of a, a weird story, but I was, um, I had a doctor's appointment early one Friday morning. When myself and my husband and the kids, we were all heading down south to Southwest WA for the weekend with friends. And I had a doctor's appointment to pick up some test results at 8 a.m. that morning. And I, I had been having some headaches. So I went into this GP expecting nothing it wasn't even my usual gp it was somebody else and, and i went into the room and she said um Derby, you have a brain tumor and it's really serious and you need to have surgery immediately and um 
And I was like, oh, oh, what's going on? And she literally reached, you know, to the bookshelf and took down her position's desk reference and she went, neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons. <laughs> and when she found the neurosurgery section, she wrote down the names of three neurosurgeons and said, whichever one of these we see you first is the doctor you need to see. So I said, okay. So I went back out to the car and I sat in the car and I had the post-it note with the neurosurgeons number names on them. And I was thinking, I better make this phone call here rather than home when the kids are there. So I phoned, I started to make, I Googled the numbers to, or names to find the numbers. And as I was doing that, my phone buzzed with an email from that agent from the Twitter pitch competition saying, I've read your 50 pages and I love them. Will you send me in the manuscript? And I was like, where's the camera? <laughs> this is like... It was like being in an episode of the Truman Show where the director decided your life is way too boring and let's just like throw in brain tumor and a literary agent. And so I, I went home and I took my husband and I took him upstairs and I, you know, to quietly tell him the news. And I said, okay, so I've got good news, I've got bad news. <laughs> I have a brain tumor, but there's a literary agent. Um, so in the end I had, two three weeks between diagnosis and surgery and um it was a really serious situation at the time but i was so thoroughly distracted by this literary agent business um that it really helped me you know i, I spent those three weeks sending my manuscript off to agents and thinking about possibilities of the future and i didn't know what was going to happen after the surgery you know but um in the end things worked out very well and by the time i was about four weeks post-surgery i was still recovering at home I got my first offer from an agent and things kind of snowballed from there. So that's a very long answer to your question, Erin. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. I, I um, this, the, the uh, tumor was a thing called a craniopharyngioma, which is quite rare. Um, but once they get it out, it tends to be out. If you have some hormone imbalances and stuff, I take, I have lots of little pill bottles going around with me, but I feel very well during the day and I'm, I'm fine. Okay, I'm glad that you got that out of the way. So the second question is, are you writing a memoir? Because I feel like that might <laughs> <laughs> No, that's literally the only interesting story. After that, there's nothing else. <laughs> wow, that is an incredible, incredible story on how this all came about. And so you write full-time now? I write full-time since October of last year. It's a, oh God, no, what are we on? January, October of the year before last. <laughs> So I was going to say when you were telling me your story, how wonderful it is to hear of, I mean, obviously not of your trials and tribulations in Ireland, but that you've like made a new start because I mean, life is so, so short yeah. and that it works like that. It worked out. It's like such a wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I, I think we often feel once we've made these early choices, you know, when we're in our thirties and our early forties, that's it. It's too late to start again. And Honestly, if things hadn't gone so terribly wrong, I probably wouldn't have had the courage to walk away from, you know, some, a well-paid job and, and our home and everything else and our families. We were pushed to it. And I thank God we were because life has never been better. You know, we've never been happier than we are now. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I feel like I would be remiss not to ask you this question. I was actually with Kelly Rimmer yesterday. She's our oh, February I author. We're on, a, we're on an Australian kick. Um, <laughs> And I did, I did ask her um, how, how things are over there because obviously we see the news and the headlines. Yes. I mean, such devastation. It's horrendous. I'm, I'm living in Western Australia, which is prone to bushfire. We have a lot of open country here. Um, but our bushfire season so far hasn't been so bad. I mean, if we're still in January, February is a very hot month as well here. So we'll wait and see. We've had some bushfires, um, one in the city actually, actually two in the city, one that was just less than three kilometers away in, in one of the local parks. Um, but we haven't had the devastation they've had in the Eastern states where things have just been horrendous. I mean, even, even up to the last couple of days, there've been very serious fires around Canberra. So it's been brutal. It's been absolutely frightening and, and um, I'm not really sure that we all know where it's going to go. I mean, obviously there'll be major changes made for next year, but it's the long-term future we're all kind of concerned about, you know? Absolutely. And I mean, our heart goes out, obviously, to all the people who lost their homes, but, but also the devastation for the animals. and the I know. It's awful seeing the photographs and so many animals lost and so many animals at risk. And I honestly think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg because when all this happened i mean it's just not possible to get, get in with cameras and really report on it because it's all so intense so i think a lot of the stories are only starting to trickle out now you know oh, gosh. 
Okay, so back to the scholar. And I am gonna ask my first question that came from Maureen in an email. And she said, she's just read the scholar and the ruin and she thoroughly enjoyed them. So that's the good news. Um, she said, you've referred to Adrian McKinty cold, cold ground in The Scholar. And she'd like to know if Sean Duffy's inspiration for, is he the inspiration for Cormac? Has <laughs> influenced you? <laughs> Sean Duffy is not the inspiration for Cormac, only because Sean is far um, funnier, I think, than Cormac ever will be. Adrian has this brilliant wry sense of humor in his writing, and I wish I could write with humor, but I'm not a particularly funny person. <laughs> so I thoroughly enjoy his books, but I think they're very different characters. I'm just a big fan. So when I had an opportunity to pop that in, I, I was pretty happy about it. And Adrian told me that um, he was in New York with his wife and they went into a bookstore and he just kind of, he knew obviously about that it was in the book and he, he just kind of picked up and pretended he was browsing through the book and then, you know, turns to his wife and she's like, what? So that was kind of a fun story to hear about that. That's cool. Um, okay, I'm going to take another question here from Katie, who is asked in the chat window. She would like to know why mystery and not a different genre, and will your new series be mystery as well? Uh, um, mystery because I love it. I love to read it, you know. I, I mean, mostly I read fantasy when I was a kid growing up. I read whatever my brothers left behind, which was science fiction and fantasy, but I preferred fantasy. And I read that all the way through my teens and probably my early 20s, and then I just... I don't really know what happened. I just Maybe I just couldn't find enough writers that I loved or the books became a little less satisfying to me as I got older maybe. But I found that when I went to the bookshop, nine times out of 10, what I was bringing home was crime fiction. And most of that was mystery. I still love it more than anything else. Like the books I'm most excited about are probably the, the uh, Robert Galbraith books. Um, Anthony Horowitz is writing such great mysteries at the moment. Ruth Ware, I love Ruth Ware, everything she writes. And those books just feel like really great old-fashioned stories to me you know I, I don't mean old-fashioned in the sense that they're not fresh but old-fashioned in that they're so satisfying you know it's not just about one of the clever twists it's about the whole thing the characters so that's what I love to read and so that's what I'm trying to write <laughs> awesome now I got two questions about the same subject and I have absolutely read both of your books and I cannot <laughs> remember what they're talking about but um, Jennifer I said in Brooklyn um, that's Brooklyn New York they were disappointed um, sorry yeah Brooklyn New York we were disappointed that the Henderson case just dropped with no resolution in the scholar uh, um, and we did, Jennifer. we did get another question from somebody else saying what happened to the Hendersons to the Hendersons um, Oh, I'm so sorry that you felt it was dropped without resolution. It isn't mentioned in the good turn, but I can tell you, if it's any good, that it's a happy ending for them. So they, in my head, I didn't write all of these scenes, but in my head, Rob Henderson was absolutely convicted. So the, the turning point is that interview that you see in the book where Cormac sort of, through a bit of dishonesty, breaks through to the family and breaks through to the mother and son and some of the, the truth of the lead up to um, what Rob was trying to do comes out. And so because that comes out, that evidence is given in court and his attempt to sort of fake uh, breakdown fails and he is convicted. But also because of that breakthrough for the mother that she's able to see things more clearly, she then is able to move forward emotionally and with her children. And so in my head, the, the mom whose first name I have never forgotten, but the mother in the, of the Henderson family and her children, they move forward and they, they kind of have a happy life together and they don't, the, the, Rob is never heard from again in their lives. So it is a happy ending for them, but I didn't write it. Fair enough, and I totally know who they are now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hard to keep track of the names when there's so many books, even for me. Uh, my problem is I read it so early on that by the time yeah. we're talking about it in book club or I'm talking to the author, I'm like, I should have reread it. But like, which book is that again? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a question here about from Ariana, and she would like to know if there'll be a book about Emma's story. Oh, wow. Well, uh, no, there isn't, but there's a lot more about Emma in The Good Turn, and Emma and Cormac's relationship is clarified, shall we say. I would say no more for fear of spoilers. Fair enough. Okay. Um, Joanne would like to know if you've ever read any ten Tana French? Tana French. Uh, I'm just looking up my bookshelves to see if I can put that, but I, she's not here. She's upstairs. 
yes, I have read everything Tana French has written and I love her. I think she's absolutely amazing. I think my favorite was The Quiet Place. I'm not sure if it's called that in the States, but that's what it was called in Ireland. If you haven't read her, she's amazing. Um, in the Woods is the first one and I adore that book. And it's got the best twist ever in it. And it was made into a TV series, which I think is going to be on stars in the US. Very recently, just in the last like six, 12 months or something. So um, I'm a big fan as well. So thank you for asking about Tana, Joanne, and I highly recommend her. I'm not even familiar with her. I'll have to pick up a copy. <laughs> All right, so another question. Your first and second book feature a strong brother-sister relationship. Is that based on anything personal? Uh, well, I have three brothers and three sisters, so yes. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in a typical large Irish family, and my parents were very hardworking, very busy people, and so we were very close. You know, we sort of dragged each other up. Big ones dragged up to small ones and so on, and so I'm still very close to my my brothers and sisters today and you know you've all the complexity of family relationships they have highs and lows and everything in between but um even though i'm living in australia and they're mostly in ireland like you know the, that closeness kind of remains and that the importance of those relationships still remain so do you get back to ireland very often because the thing about australia i find is it just so far from everything <laughs> Oh my God, it's so far from everything. I, I was in, uh, last year I was in the States, I was in over in uh, Dallas for VoucherCon and then I flew back to Charlottesville. So I had to get from Charlottesville to Western Australia and I think it was 34 hours of travel. By the time I got home, I was an absolute zombie. So that's the price you pay for living here. It's a stunningly beautiful country, but the travel is brutal. So the last couple of years I have gone back, I've gone to Ireland um, to promote my books and to see family. This year, I'm not going, but I have three sets of visitors. My sister's coming for a few weeks, my parents are coming for a month, and my husband's parents are coming for a month. So that will keep us going, and then we'll go, probably go back next year. That's the other thing about it being so far away, is your, your guests come for long periods of time, which is either good or bad. <laughs> yes, it, it's mostly good. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. All right, we have so many questions. <laughs> Okay, let's go to Elena. She wants to know the reasoning behind not making Emma the murderer in the end, and more about the thought process in choosing the killer. Thought process in choosing the killer. That's a really good question. I have to think about that one. I, I, think, I think about it a lot. Sometimes I don't know at the beginning who the killer is going to be. With Emma, I think I never really considered her to be the murderer because she had no motive. You know, she really didn't. I... She is someone who's very driven by her work. She's completely, that's what all of her focus and interest lies. And, and she doesn't, there was no reason for her to, to do anything like that. Um, but you could see how someone could suspect her from the outside looking in, someone who doesn't know her well or, or, or might be misled by certain things. So she was, I guess, a useful red herring for me at a certain point. You want to have a killer where it doesn't feel convenient for the writer. I don't want the reader to feel like, oh, you know, I followed this book the whole way through. I gave it my attention. I gave it my interest and I was emotionally engaged. And now the writer has just cheated and thrown in the stupid killer at the end. And it's really just not satisfying because it doesn't make sense from this, for this, how the story ran from the beginning or it's not consistent with the characterization, you know? So I'm trying to find a killer where all of it makes sense and you can look back at the beginning of it and say, oh, I sh there were suggestions. I, the writer did play fair with me. Maybe I could have figured this out. Or at least, you know, yeah, okay, I can see how that could happen. And like, not everybody's going to agree with me. I mean, I, I would say that's probably the thing that's most, that will be most debated in most books. People will get to the end and go, okay, fair enough. But I didn't, you know, not totally convinced that that was the only person who could have done it or so on and so forth. So for me, I knew who the murderer was. I knew it was murder quite early on and as a writer it's just about trying to find a way to paint in fair hints for the reader so that the characterization is consistent throughout I know why he's saying what he's saying when he says it and I'm, I'm giving you just enough I hope that's what I'm aiming for but I don't know if I'm always successful okay uh, I have such a good question I not one that I ever thought of myself but um <laughs> So the question is, how did Fisher know the coat was green? If the surveillance video, which caught on his car at Caroline's apartment, was in black and white, this <laughs> left the members 
of our chapter to believe that Fisher was in on it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just too good. I <laughs> um, let me see if I can come up with an answer. Very quickly. <laughs> no, it's just a mistake. Um, I don't know. I, that's a really good question. I have to go back and think about what I was thinking at the time. I, I know that in my head I saw him recognizing the style of the coat, the cut of the coat, the length of the coat, but I probably did refer to green in the book. So it's, I'm so sorry. That's literally just a mistake. And nobody's ever asked you that before, I'm guessing. No, it's the first time it's ever been asked. <laughs> of course. Fair enough. Um, all right. Uh, let's ask you an easier question now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Katie would like to know, Katie from Columbus, Ohio would like to know, there is a big science component to the scholar. How did you come up with the topics, ideas for the research um, the characters are doing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it probably started a little bit because of my background in law. So when I was working in Ireland, you know, Ireland is a very small country, but it, it trades a lot internationally, partly because it's part of the European Union and then it's close proximity geographically to the US and also the history relationships, you know. so. We have a lot of American multinational companies in Ireland and a lot of smaller Irish companies that trade. So if you work in law in Ireland, you, you deal with a lot of that. And I worked for a while for a company that made very innovative um, medical devices. So they were actually involved in making really, really um, high-end nebulizers that are used in hospitals. So new drug delivery systems through aerosol. Okay. And so I worked on those contracts and I got a really interesting insight into how those sorts of things were formed. That company was absolutely nothing like the company that appears in the book I'd like to uh, emphasize. But um, I knew I wanted to do something with that knowledge, if you like. So I was looking for um, some sort of thing where there would be a dual component, a, a physical device and a drug, so that I could have those two interactions that would work for the plot. And I just did, I just did some research. I mean, my friend Google was very helpful. I wanted it to be something that was super cutting edge, that would be, um, you know, massively valuable, that there would be so much money that it would motivate people to something as extreme as murder. And so I, I stumbled across an article that just seemed a perfect fit. And once I had that basic research, I just read a little bit more about it. But I mean, look, my, if I'm very honest with you guys, science has never been my strong point. So I, I as a lawyer, you, you learn to because if you're working with a lot of different companies, a lot of different technologies, you learn enough to understand the commercial, import, you know, the really important things commercially, but you don't have to understand exactly how the science works. You just have to be able to describe it. So that's a little skill I was able to take, you know, take this bit of research and, and, and use it in the book as it needs to be used, but I didn't need to go into it in depth, thankfully, because I would struggle. Huh. Um. You talk a little bit about your law background and how that helped you in this process. Is there other areas that having a law background has been useful? A little bit. I mean, because I did commercial law, I didn't have the background in criminal that would give it you, you know, it's a bit more, some more interesting stories maybe. But I, because I had, you know, obviously I went to law school with people who did go on to criminal defense law. I have heard a few stories around the table. Things that would sort of, shock you if you're working in that area and I think some of it I may have used some of it in one of, one of the books or a part of a story there was a terrible thing that happened in Galway many years ago where a young exchange student came to Galway and, and she was living with the host family and she went out for drinks with friends and she walked home through a park that was dangerous and she was um she was raped and she was murdered and the police caught the guy immediately they knew who he was because he had he had been guilty of a number of rapes before and he was out on bail for a previous offence and it turned out the only reason he was out on bail was because of a backlog in processing rape kits. The, just the bureaucratic <laughs> delay in processing rape kits because of the cost of them, there was like an 18 month lag or something, meant that he was out on bail. Because the way the bail system works, is one of the things the judge considers when they're deciding whether or not to grant bail is the strength of the evidence against the accused. If the evidence against the accused is very strong, that is considered as part of the application. So if this rape kit had been tested and, and it clearly showed it was him, he would never have been released on bail and he would never have been out in order to attack that young girl. And you just think, none of us really consider that things turn on something so stupid, on there being enough money to process these kits, you know? And that's the sort of little thing you hear about when you're in the back room, I guess. And a few other stories that are pretty, stomach churning. So some of that kind of does trickle into the book in certain ways. 
but in terms of my own background i think the only thing that's really been helpful is the the brain training for lack of a better word if you if you work on commercial contracts they're they're absolute tomes you know they tend to be 300 pages long and that doesn't include the appendices and you have to remember that if you change clause 2ac part 3 that's going to impact this clause this clause this one and this one and also this appendices and you have to keep the map of the contract clear in your head and i think that helps if you're writing a hundred thousand word novel to keep the story clear and the character development clear and the you know the rhythm of it and the pace of it so that it feels natural to the reader but all the pieces are in the right spot so i think it helps with just the memory training that's about all i can say no that's fascinating absolutely um so ram z who is in park city utah has more of a comment than a question but she said that she loves that the crime is solvable with information given in the books given in the book oh yay and she really enjoyed both the ruin and the scholar so oh thank you so much thank you for reading and thank you for saying that that's really lovely to hear um and katrina who is calling in from calgary alberta has asked um when delia and kareen in fact were they in fact trading places at times she said she thinks you might know this, but thinking back on the novel, <laughs> it comes to mind. Oh, I totally know that feeling, Katrina. They did change places for exams. Um, they definitely did do that. So um, uh, Della sat some of Carlene's exams at the end of the first year, um, to, and that was part of their arrangement. So beyond that, they, they might have, but I, it wasn't something that was really on my mind as necessary. They would have done it only when they absolutely had to. Um, but yeah, that was definitely something they did. All right. Um, I have an email question. Uh, what happened to Paul? Or what do you think happened to Paul? Oh, Paul being uh, Della's little brother? Yes. Am I remembering correctly? Yes, I remember. <laughs> That's three books away from me, guys. I'm struggling. <laughs> um, Paul, I don't know. I worry about him sometimes because his parents are so horrific. Mm -hmm. And even though he had some money, thanks to Della, like you still have to get away and you still have to survive and you still have to build a life for yourself. And he was so young at the end of the book, he had a long path ahead of him. And he was so devastated by the loss of his sister because if you think about it, she was his only ally. She was the only person in his life who loved him and the only person who cared about him. And now he's gone, he's still living with his parents, he's too young to just leave. And even if he left, what would structure would he have? So the answer is, as a writer, I don't know, but I worry about him. I want the best for him, but I worry about him. You never know. If I come back to these books again, there might be an opportunity to find him as an older character and see where, what, where life brought him. But I haven't thought about it yet. And I feel like you might have answered this um, already, but just to go over again, because it was a very specific question I received about, about the relationship between Cormac and, um, and to know if there's any background or we're going to find out any more about what happened previously or... With Cormac and Emma? Yes. Well, I don't want to give away too much about the good turn, but um, I feel I felt like with the scholar, we saw their background and their history and how they came together. And you can also see the fault lines that lie in the relationship as a result of how they came together and also just their differences. You know, they love each other, genuinely love each other very much, and they're both very good people. But but that doesn't make life easy, as we all know. You know, two, as someone said the other day, I think it was Bradley Cooper's ex said, you know, two great people coming together don't necessarily make a great couple. And I think that they have been a good couple, but whether or not they remain so, you have to read the book and find out. So I think I've left them at the end of the scholar with this really difficult thing where they have come back together, but, but they've been shaken by what happens in the scholar. And then in the good turn, I felt like it wouldn't be fair to the reader to just leave that unresolved. So it is resolved in the book one way or the other. Um, but I, it's less about their background. The Good Turn is really about the events of The Good Turn and Cormac and Emma's relationship is a smaller part of that book, but it is resolved. Well, um, I know in, our own, in my own book club here, we, a lot of conversation around the fact that he actually thought for a moment that maybe she was guilty. So, yeah. And I, I was kind of coming quick to her, to, or sorry, to his defense being like, you're a policeman, like you are taught to think like that. Yeah. But, um, a lot of people didn't buy it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of unforgivable. It's kind of unforgivable. If, you, if, you, if you're a woman and you think, oh my God, my partner's 
thought even for a second that I could murder someone like how who is he that he would be with someone that he could think that about and how, how could he love me if he if he could even hold that thought in his head for a second and you know Cormac defends himself by saying I know I know but you have to understand that I this is my entire life has been this and I couldn't ignore the stuff that was in front of me and I, I rejected it but it was there for a minute I, I believe him when he says that, but that doesn't make it okay. Mm -hmm. And whether or not she can handle that is a really big question, because I don't know if I could handle it, if my partner even for a second thought that. But anybody who's been in a long-term relationship knows that we all have to kind of accept different things about each other, and, and we're not the same people. So there will be moments where you just don't get something about the other person, and you have to just choose to accept it or not. Some things I think you can, and some things maybe you can't. Well, the other thing that called it into question was the trauma that she had gone through already. And like, did that change her so much that? Yeah, yeah, it could have. I think it's, it's possible. It certainly could have. So I think he's, he could, I think there's room for him to defend what he did, what he did that, he, that he held this thought for a second, but it is still a pretty big betrayal in a relationship, I think. Absolutely. Okay, Katie would like to know why you set the book in Ireland if you're living in Australia. <laughs> oh, it's a good question. I, I set them in Ireland because it's still the place I know better than anywhere else. When I started writing, I had only been in Australia for a few years. And it just, you know, when I thought about a story, well, actually part of it, the real reason was, when I think about it, the story of the ruin started for me with Maud. I knew who Maud was. I knew who Jack was. I had this image of them in this country crumbling house in, in Ireland and because of who they were and because of where they'd come from it was always going to be an Irish story it just had to be and so it naturally became that it was easier for me to write it there obviously because I know Galway so well I mean I literally I know every inch of the pavement almost it's a small city you know it was a medieval city so everything's quite contained and so writing the book in Ireland was well it was driven by the characters started with the characters but it was easy to stay there I won't I think I won't always stay with books written in Ireland but that was just the natural place for it to be in for me I can accept that all right so I have my, uh, a little bit of a fun question now and I mean some authors hate this some authors love it <laughs> to this person and um, it was an emailed um, question and they've actually given you some suggestions and sometimes it's just, <laughs> okay go <laughs> So it's, if an actor could play Cormac, who would it be? And they came up with some suggestions and there, they said that their group was split, George Clooney or Tom Hanks, <laughs> or, <laughs> nice. and Gwyneth Paltrow for Emma. Oh my God, that's so funny. Oh God, well back in the day, um, I had, you know, fantasy casting is one of the best games ever. I used to play with my agent, but um, Actually, The Ruin was optioned by Hopscotch Features and then Cormac, or Colin Farrell's production company yeah. kind of joined as a producer. Yeah. Yeah. So there have been suggestions that he might play Cormac if it, be, if, it, if it goes on and gets through development. I would be waiting to see. I would love Colin Farrell. I kind of, I could almost see why people are saying like the George Clooney Tom Hanks because I see him in that kind of age group and I see him as a sort of, He's kind, you know, he's got a kind, he's a kind man. So I could see that for me, Emma's always been Jennifer Connelly. Okay. Long dark hair and blah, blah, blah. that's who I see Emma as. I feel like Tom Hanks is too old. Yeah, he is. Maybe now. Yeah, he's too old. Yeah, because yeah, not... Cormac has a bit of sex appeal too. And I always feel like Tom Hanks is like a really nice dad. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, okay. So we have, we have so many questions. For you. They just keep talking. I do want to talk a little bit about before before we run out of time um, about your next book, and I'd also like to know a little bit about um, how you write um, because it's so interesting to hear authors' process. So if you could speak to your process maybe first, and then we'll move on to what else is coming up. Sure. Um, process is I. I start with, gosh, it's funny to be talking to you guys about this here because this is where I work. I literally have, let me see what's in this desk of mine. Uh, this is, um, that was for a book I was writing. Okay, so that's the book two structural edit notebook. So this is the scholar's structural edit notebook, actually. So you can see my structural edit notes. Oh, wow. Um, 
like, basically what happens is I start with a notebook exactly like this, because these are the ones I like, and I start by writing notes about a character that I love. So I'm trying to think about Handwritten. Handwritten. Who do I, you know, who is making me feel something? So in, um, in The Scholar, it was Carleen and Della. Those two girls were everything for me, and that they were the heart of the story, and I needed to know who they were. So I'll start writing everything I know about the character on the piece of paper. Um, if I had my early notebook here, but I think I'm going away. It would, I'd be able to show you just literally the character name, you know, height, weight, um, age, where they went to school, how many brothers and sisters they have, you know, have they got anything particularly physically about them that's memorable, um, who, who their parents are. And out of that comes the story, really. You know, these relationships build the story. Who is in their life? And what is the murder going to be? And therefore, where are the points of tension in these relationships? And once I've built out a few characters, then I just sit down and I write a list of scenes I think are going to be really fun to write to the story. What are the scenes I'm most excited to write? And that kind of is the beginning of an outline. Once I have that, I start writing the story. And usually back in the day when I was still working, I kind of formed the habit of two hour um, stints. So the first half hour I'd write by hand. Everything I think is going to happen in the scene, what the characters are thinking about when they come into the scene, so on and so forth. And then for the next hour and a half, I will write in my computer and I'll try and hit about 500 words for every half hour. So trying to finish with about 1,500 words, which I certainly wasn't doing in the beginning, I'm hasten to add, but as you get further in, you get a bit faster. So once I have about 40,000 words, I usually go back and rewrite. And then I write a proper outline and then I finish the draft. When I've done all that, <laughs> I'm going to show you something now. I end up with... Um, something that looks like, well, basically printed pages that look like a manuscript. And then the next stage is my edit. So I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but this okay. is last night's work. You can see I was very pleased with what I had written. <laughs> and I will go through it and I will correct and rewrite and cut bits and write in bits and, um, and basically completely rewrite the whole draft from beginning to end. When that's done, I'll do one last polish and then I'll send it off to my agent and then it goes to my editors. Then we'll do a structural edit, at least one, and then at least one copy edit, maybe two, and then like a full copy edit and then some tweaks and then a proofread. And then I get final pages and then my editor rings me and gives me a lecture about not editing my final pages and I still edit my final pages <laughs> and then we have a book. So, you know, when the proof copies go out, this is a proof of the good turn that went out to early readers here and there's significant differences between that book and the final version because I can't leave it alone you know so those are the two that's a proof and that's the final and I still changed quite a bit because for me it's all about those small little brush strokes at the end of the book that just make they're like grace notes in a piece of music you know they just bring it to another level so I really want to get that right and I never want to let it go until I've done every single thing I can and then I'm still not happy ever. I probably will never, I hope I'm never happy with the books because I, I think that energy is what pushes you on, you know? And so I am, um, I don't know, I, I'm never fully satisfied, but I, they just have to pry it out of my hands and I have to let it go. And then once I've let it go, I never, ever, ever want to read it again. I'm done at that stage. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's so interesting. And do you read reviews or do you like shy away from them? I do. I certainly did the early books. I mean, well, I'm only three books in, so they're all early books, but I certainly did for The Room. I read everything. For The Scholar, I read most of it. I think I probably read less for The Good Turn. I think I've begun to accept, you know, properly deep down that things like Goodreads, they're for readers, you know? Readers have to be able to go on Goodreads and just share their thoughts. Good, bad, indifferent, everything in between. It's not really a place for writers to be hanging out and reading every word and feeling it, you know? Once you let the book go, that's your work done. It has to just go and let the readers respond to it as they want and bring to it what they want. And the same with reviewers and newspapers and everywhere else. Everybody has their own view. Probably would read most of, most or all of reviews that are in newspapers and stuff just because it's awfully hard to resist. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not massively sensitive about reviews one way or the other. I've been fortunate enough that they've mostly been really good. And if people aren't loving it, I kind of accept that. I mean, none of us love every book that we read. It's subjective, so I, I don't take it too personally. Well, that's good, because I know that, I, I certainly know some authors that um, live and die by reviews. They just... Yeah, that's too hard. That's not an easy way to live, I think. 
Well, and to be fair to you, um, if you do look on Goodreads, um, both of her books have very, very high ratings. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Goodreaders. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, and now we'd love to hear about, so we have heard a little bit about The Good Turn and we're all very excited. Um, you said it was coming out in the spring, hopefully, in the US? Yeah, I think it's gonna be a little bit later. It's, it's out here in about four weeks and it's gonna be a little bit later in the States. I wish I had a date for you guys, but it's a little bit up in the air. There are a few things going on, so that hasn't quite settled yet. But as soon as I know about it, I'll post it on Twitter and Facebook, because so I'm getting a lot of emails at the moment, because I think, I think um, US readers are seeing some of the social media about it and they're saying, "Where I've tried to get pre-order and I can't do it, what's going on? I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do it yet. But it is coming, it's just gonna be a little delayed. Well, we would love to tell all of our readers, we love to follow our authors. So oh, it's, it's, especially in like a case like this where we've all read the second book and a lot of us have read the first book, we would love to promote your third. So please do. Oh, thank you. I will let you know as soon as I know you will know. Okay. Um, and so there's a new book that is completely out of out of the Cormac series. So can you tell us anything about that? I know that you're Ooh, just. I can't. Oh, that's really weird. Usually when I'm talking about a book, I've finished it. Right. So it feels weird to kind of. I haven't finished this one, as you can clearly see. <laughs> oh. I'm right in the middle of it. I can only tell you that it's set in the states. Okay. That's about all I can tell you, and it's a standalone. I'm not allowed to say anything else. I'm fear of being shot. Um, but also because it feels weird. I, I feel like it's too, I'm feeling it too much. It's still that, that really just making it stage. So it's a little too soon. Well, and it's it sounds like it's going to go through a lot of revisions before we... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And if I did tell you what it was about right now, there'd be absolutely no point because it'll be a totally different book by the time it comes out next year. But it is mystery. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you for writing. Thank you for pursuing your passion. Um, thank you. We all love the scholar and we can't wait to read The Good Turn and then The Secret Book. <laughs> yes, The so, Secret Book. Um, we will certainly keep up to date and keep everybody in the loop in whatever's coming down the pipeline with you. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, for choosing The Scholar. It was, I really was so excited when I heard that you had chosen the book because I was keeping my fingers crossed. And thank you, everybody, for reading and for commenting and for caring. It's, it's really lovely as a writer when we're holed up in our little studies and writing alone quietly when the book goes out and people respond to it. It, it really matters. So thanks a million. And I do need to say one last thing. Um, I did choose it for our vote, but they voted on it. Our members They voted on it. Well, thank you very much for voting on it. That's amazing. Even better. For sure. Thank you, ladies, for all your questions. There's still so many on the chat window. I'm sorry we won't get to them. <laughs> um, thank you all for joining us. And um, we will post this online so that everybody can, uh, can hear it moving forward. Thank cool. you again. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.